Hi, everybody. Welcome and thanks for uh, joining us here this, this morning. Uh, it is early morning here in Perth, so um, I'm hoping that you can all see uh, my PowerPoint presentation there with a pink little banner there. Can I just get a nod of heads if everybody can see that? Um, yep, great, perfect. Okay, so I've been truly blessed by being part of an ecclesial movement, having my own journey of evangelization, uh, being uh, impacted by uh, the disciples of Jesus Covenant Community, which is, of course, one of these uh, wonderful phenomenon called an ecclesial movement. So what we're going to try and do today is we're going to try and work out just what ecclesial movements are and um, also just tackle some of the things around how we can really work out how they can best function in the life of the church. We need to also think about the charisms that they bring to the church um, and how the Holy Spirit is working in amazing ways through ecclesial movements. Um, just why these movements, ecclesial movements, seem to be so um, so um, impactful in the world of evangelization, and how we need to really continue to encourage this across the board, and then look at how can we sustain both the ecclesial movements and their charisms so they continue to be a rich blessing in the life of the church. So just very quickly, I think um, it's important for us to just get our heads around what an ecclesial movement is, and I'm hoping um, uh, this isn't too basic for everybody, but just so that we're all on the same page, it, it's really a term that's used that um, we see a whole pile of volunteer groups and associations uh, coming to life in the life of the church over the last 100 years or so. And they've really helped the church to stretch its horizons with regards to mission and ministry. The fact that we use the word movement in, in this phrase also alludes to us that the Holy Spirit is actually really important in what is going on with ecclesial movements. And just uh, so that you might be aware, here is just some examples of some of the ecclesial movements that are at work in the life of the church here in Australia and doing amazing things. These are only, uh, you know, just some of them. So if there's anybody from other ecclesial movements who've, who've come on board and you can't see your, your movement there, I sincerely apologise, but I couldn't fit too many more on the page. But there's uh, quite a few, as you can see. Hi, Mario, and, so Mario yeah. can, I just, can I just get you to um, adjust your screen? So we're, we're, we're able to see your notes. Ah, are you? Okay. Yes. So Sorry, I... Sorry to interrupt you. I just thought that no, you might like that. to. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. So how about we go to this one here? That's very important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. I think okay. that's, that's better. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, as we keep going, so hopefully you can see there just um, some of those wonderful ecclesial movements that are impacting the life of the church today. Um, there are some really key things that uh, allow for ecclesial movements to actually uh, do what it is that they do, and each seem to have similar characteristics. And I just want to quickly run through this because without having an understanding as to why there's such richness coming through ecclesial movements, uh, we can sometimes misunderstand what they're on about. So first and foremost, each of the ecclesial movements are founded by by somebody who sees a need in the life of the church and they're responding in some way to that need. And the Holy Spirit um, works powerfully in them, providing them with a charism. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But this charism is meant to assist in meeting the needs in the life of the church based on what is occurring to this founder. Both of these ecclesial movements are made up of laity. So lay members of the church join these ecclesial movements in some form of commitment. They're pretty highly structured and they have a communal expression, a way of living that draws them together. There's um, strong teaching and most of that teaching is really around how to flesh out the charism of the ecclesial movement so that everybody's on the same page with regards to its mission and ministry. 
And then what we see is um, a real strong commitment to evangelization. So these ecclesial movements really want to bring forth an encounter with Christ in the, the very way that they are going about being who they are. And, of course, one of the most important things for ecclesial movements is they have strong relationships with the, with the ecclesial authorities in the life of the church, with our bishops, with, the, with our conferences, etc. So keeping that in mind, why do people join ecclesial movements? And there's a number of different reasons, but I think one of the reasons, some of the reasons are here before you. So that there's a strong emphasis on, the, um, on drawing people into the apostolic mission of the church, bring, bringing people into an encounter with Jesus Christ. Some will join because of the fact that they have, um, they're really connected into a style of prayer or spirituality that, that means something to them. They're also very important for connecting people through relationships. And these aren't just acquaintances. These are committed relationships where people um, uh, are really uh, encouraged to make some form of commitment to one another and not just to the life of the church. There's a, a real emphasis on sharing gifts in ecclesial um, movements, and it's not just natural gifts, but also spiritual gifts. And uh, as we're aware, there are, there are dozens of gifts mentioned, particularly in the New Testament, and each of these gifts are really um, encouraged in the members of these ecclesial movements. There's strong support for the Christian life, and as we all know, the Christian life's not an easy one. Right, Christ never promised us an easy life. He promised us that we'd have to pick up our cross and carry it. And so this support to be able to do that, to, to pick up the crosses, to work through the trials and, and to work through the struggles of life is really important. And, of course, um, there's a, a, a real emphasis on discipleship. And discipleship's very important when it comes to maturing and growing in faith and equipping and empowering people to live out their faith um, across the various stages of their life. There's strong provision of formation. So there'll be um, uh, lots of opportunities for members to, to grow in their knowledge and their experience of church teaching. I think two of the most important things that we see in ecclesial movements is that there's an opportunity for people to exercise leadership. Um, for lay people to do this. And that's both in the form of pastoral leadership, so, so looking out for, for members in their ecclesial groups, but also the missionary leadership. That is to, to go forth and to, to reach out, to um, you know, put on those sandals and uh, get off the couch and to, to go forth and uh, bring the gospel into the, the places and uh, uh, places that members are experiencing in their life. So these are part of the things that most people find attractive to ecclesial movements. But there are some cautions, and, um, and I've experienced these cautions in my own experience of being in uh, ecclesial movements. And there are times where people can be quite elitist, and we've got to really challenge that, you know, um, trying to make sure that, you know, there's no arrogance about the, the spiritual journey or anything like that. Um, in ecclesial movements. Um, people can be solely focused on the particular mission or spirituality of that ecclesial movement and um, to the detriment of other spiritualities or other mission fields. There can be a demand for, alle for allegiance of members um, and, uh, and that demand is both a blessing but it can be a curse for some people where um, you know, it asks so much of their time and energy. There can be the exaltation on the teachings of or the vision of founders, and, um, and I think that this can be to the detriment of um, seeing the spirit continuing to move and bring a freshness into ecclesial movements. There's also another sort of caution, I think, in ecclesial movements around this, and that is when we have the transition of leadership from the founder to the next generation of leaders. 
And that can uh, sometimes work against ecclesial movements. And of course, uh, competition between parishes, other movements and agencies always exists. And this is, this is why we should try and avoid working in silos when it comes to our ministry and mission work in the life of the church. And ecclesial movements, you know, our encouragement really is that they're seeing outside of themselves and building relationships with other ministries, with other movements, and of course, in the life of uh, parishes. Um, Pope John Paul II was very uh, strongly advocating for ecclesial movements and in his, um, in his document, Christopher Daly's Leitch, he, he, he spoke about the criteria of ecclesiality and this criteria is really important so that it supports the work of ecclesial movements. And within this document, Pope John Paul II spoke about these five areas that actually helps ecclesial movements to be who they're being called to be by the Holy Spirit. First and foremost, that holiness has to be something that's encouraged in each member, that there's a willingness and a, um, to witness a strong and authentic communion with the life of the church. I think that's really important there, what Pope John Paul II was seeing for ecclesial movements. They're going to remain connected as strongly as possible into the life of the church, not see itself outside the church. Um, that they should have strong presence in human society. So it's not just about the be all and end all of that ecclesial movement, but it's actually about impacting in the life of the church and in society itself that we have a responsibility to, um, to really pr protect the Catholic faith and to, to speak authentically of our own journey in the Catholic faith and that there's a conformity to and a participation in the church's apostolic mission. And hence, you know, this conference is all about evangelization and ecclesial movements should be connected into what is the latest um, encouragement around evangelization and where that's being directed. So Pope John Paul II working really well there to assist and support ecclesial movements that he could see uh, being some of the fruit, particularly of Vatican II. Um, I, I was really interested when I was doing some research, research on this that the Canadian Catholic um, uh, Bishops Conference uh, talked about using this document and some of the criteria for ecclesiality to actually help them uh, support ecclesial movements to be um, as fruitful as they possibly could. And they use these six statements to help gauge the health of ecclesial movements. And I thought this was really interesting. So they talk about accountability. And that's this is the accountability to, to church authority that, you know, that ecclesial movements aren't um, a power to themselves, but actually that they are strongly connected into um, the life of the church through strong relationships and statutes with the church. Implantation. I thought that's a great word, don't you? Um, so that ecclesial movements are actually implanted into the life of the local church. So in parish life, that they're really blessing parishes. Uh, they're blessing their diocese um, and see themselves as actually uh, uh, an instrument of God's work to, to bless the church as a whole. Authentic doctrine, as we've mentioned earlier, should be at the heart of their teaching, that there's a sense of complementarity. Now, I thought this was interesting too. So complementarity meaning here that ecclesial uh, movements aren't competing against each other or, you know, stepping into one another's sort of ways of, of being um, a blessing in the life of the church that they're recognising the gift of other ecclesial movements and other ministries in the life of the church and not stepping into, um, into those areas. Social involvement, of course, really important that we're impacting on society. And again, holiness comes to the fore. So um, some interesting thoughts there. So just quickly, charism. Why is charism so important to ecclesial movements? And I think this is um, um, something that we've got to be very conscious of. So um, for each of the ecclesial movements, they will be driven by the charism that was uh, instilled into their founder. It doesn't mean that charism stays the same. 
So it, it's always this idea that the charism of the founder is moved into um, drawing others into a mission, but that that mission can change as, as long as the charism stays intact. So, for instance, you might have a, a, a charism that reaches out to the poor or to young people, but you can do that that um, blessing of young people and the poor in lots of different ways. But the charism is what continues to drive these ecclesial movements. And I think that to help us sustain the evangelising force of um, ecclesial movements, one of the things that we've got to really do is actually encourage these movements to constantly be talking about their charism. What do they understand their charism to be? And, of course, part of the reason why we have missionary um, disciples in these ecclesial movements is because there's a, there's a whole range of uh, experiences that come through being part of ecclesial movements. One is that ecclesial movements are, are very communal. And so because they're communal, it means that people are being encouraged not only in their own personal journey, but they're being encouraged to actually share that journey with others. I think there's um, other things that help bring about um, evangelization for ecclesial movements, and that is that ecclesial movements actually see that they want to be intergenerational, that they want to impact not just on those who first experience the charism, but they see that this charism is is important for the generations to come. And, and I'm part of a, a community that you know, our oldest members are now into their 90s, but our youngest members are little babies being born. You know, we've had so many babies born into our community this year alone. So we see ourselves as being really blessed by being intergenerational. So this idea of missionary disciples making missionary disciples both within the ecclesial movement itself, but also reaching out to draw people into a sense of being a missionary in their, in their current context, wherever that is. We don't need to go overseas to be missionary. We're missionary right here in our, in our urban settings or in our rural settings. We, we, you know, we really want to encourage people to see that that, that idea of being intergenerational, being sustainable, that we want to pass on this charism from, from one generation to the next generation. I think one of the other things too that I think is very important is that evangel the part of the evangelising force in ecclesial movements is this desire to actually help people to be empowered and to be equipped. And, um, and there's lots of work that's done in ecclesial movements to do that, to empower people, to commission them, to go forth, to work in mission, to work in ministries, and to, to give of themselves. One of the things that I was really astounded by is some of the recent statistics around COVID, where we found that the... Um, that volunteerism has really dropped across society to the point where we're hearing that for some young people that they're giving one hour of volunteer hours um, a month since COVID. And, um, and, and I think this doesn't exist in ecclesial movements. Ecclesial movements are very, very strong in their encouragement for people to serve, to give of themselves for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of drawing people into face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus Christ. So there's quite a few things there that I think sustain our ecclesial movements in being evangelising forces. But there are some things that I'd just like to finish off this input by with regards to talking about sustainability. And I think that um, for ecclesial movements to be sustained um, in, the, in our experience of the church today, we really need to accompany one another. I think ecclesial movements need to, you know, where as much as possible, 
um, avoid working in silos. I think the more that we can connect with one another across ecclesial movements, as well as um, in parish life and with the diocesan agencies, we accompany and learn to be in relationship with each other, learn about one another. I think that's going to really um, benefit uh, the work of evangelization. I think managing expectations is also very important because um, I myself, I work with lots of young people and I find that uh, where we have young people, uh, the church in general would like to get their hands on young people and say, hey, could you help us out here? Could you help us out there? And I think that sometimes we can expect too much from our ecclesial movements outside of what it is that they're, that they're invested in and that they're devoted to. And to really try and manage the expectations of, um, of how we see people who are members of those ecclesial movements. We should encourage membership in ecclesial movements. And what I mean by that is um, I think uh, not everybody has the same spirituality or the same sense of mission and ministry. But ecclesial movements offer a variety of ways that people can find that their particular gift, their particular charism, can actually fit in the life of the church. And so to really encourage people, if they don't fit in our ecclesial movement, that actually maybe that there is another. And because of our broadening, broadening relationships with each other, we can actually direct people to a better fit for who they are. Supporting ecclesial movements, I've, I've put here generally because I think this is something that I've found really beneficial for us, um, where we've leaned into all of the, the wonderful um, support mechanisms in our archdiocese here in Perth, from the professional standards office to the arch archbishop's office to the vicar general to just being able to lean into the wisdom of the church and its agencies and and i find that they support us incredibly well because of the fact that um, we've learnt just that we don't have it all in our ecclesial movements. We've, there's so much expertise out there that can support ecclesial movements, particularly, you know, in, um, in areas of tension or where there's conflict, to really reach out and to, to seek support from outside ecclesial movements that can actually benefit ecclesial movements. And then finally, just like to throw in this last little message, I think that the best way for us to sustain ecclesial movements in their evangelization mission, I think that is to actually bless each other, you know, to, um, to really come to a knowledge of what each other's doing, to, to um, pray for one another, and we would get the opportunity to pray with each other in the sense of blessing one another in the work, in the charism, in the particular ministries and the, and the works of each of these ecclesial movements to benefit one another and not to, not to just see ourselves as the be-all and end-all within our own boundaries of ecclesial movements. So, Sharon, I think that's um, about 20 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer, I'm sorry about that, but, um, yeah, just some thoughts there on helping us to continue to be powerful agents of evangelization.